offer you some coffee, sir. How did you take your coffee? I want sugar. I trust your journey here was pleasant. We left and steamed up from Baton Rouge early yesterday morning, past the fortifications at Port Hudson. It reminded me of the purpose of my visit. What can I do for you? We understand that you presided over the burial of a Union officer during the war. We'd like for you to tell us a little bit about that so we can pass it on to our readers. I understand then you want to know about the day the war stopped. In order to understand the significance of this incident, I should first place it in the context of the broader war. The Union grand strategy was to completely encircle the Confederacy and choke it to death. In order to accomplish this, the only remaining portion not under federal control was a stretch of the river between the two Confederate bastions at Vicksburg and Port Hudson. Admiral Farragut sent part of his fleet north to run the batteries at Port Hudson. One of the ships in that fleet was USS Albatross, commanded at that time by Commander John Hart. At some interval subsequent to the cessation of hostilities, we learned that four days prior to his demise, Commander Hart had written a letter to his wife in Schenectady, New York. It is obvious from the tenor of the letter that he was most elated over the performance of his crew and ship in successfully running the Confederate batteries at Port Hudson, which were most formidable. He was elated over this success and in his letter even included little anecdotes of life aboard ship such as the ship's cat giving birth to a litter of kittens. But at this point his whole tone was jovial. These are the words of Commander Hart. I don't know when I'll get this letter off to you, but I'll write it anyway. I have to send our mail six miles through hot sun and over swamp. Every day our postman comes on board with some little adventure and tells us about having to dodge from one tree to another to avoid the rebel bullets, which they will amuse themselves in sending across the river. The guns at Port Hudson, which have for the past month been firing every night, have ceased and silence means sometimes as much as noise does. But my little boat is quite a wonder, and it is as well known on this river as the name of the river itself. We know from his letter to his wife that his mood had been as I described, but we later learned that he was suffering interminable pain from a gastric disease, and this, I can only speculate, led to a great state of anxiety.
Albatross's executive officer, Lieutenant Commander Dubois, himself a Mason, undertook to fulfill his captain's last request to be buried with Masonic honors. He and a couple of the ship's crew went ashore into hostile territory under a flag of truce. Once ashore, he encountered the White Brothers, Masons also, from a lodge in Kentucky, who directed him to the local Masonic Lodge in St. Francisville, Feliciana Lodge number 31, free and accepted Masons. Theodore Dubois, the Federal Combo Albatross. Is there a Masonic Lodge nearby? There is, in the town of St. Francis. Will you take me there? I will. What brings you here? Well, Captain Leak, I'd like to have a word with you, please, sir. Most certainly, sir. What can I do for you, sir? Captain Lee, we've got a Union gunboat off the shores of Bayou Sara in the Mississippi River. One of the officers from that ship came ashore and requested a Masonic service for their commanding officer who lost his life on the ship. Do we know that the deceased is a Mason? I did a thorough examination of the officer that came ashore and he can vouch for the brother. And that vouchment is sufficient. As an officer of the Army of the Confederate States of America, I consider it my obligation to permit the enemy to bury their dead. Moreover, as you know full well, as Masons, we have the responsibility to grant our deceased brother's request, so we will be happy to perform the ceremony. Very good, sir. Tell the officer from the ship mid-afternoon today. Will do, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Good day, sir. Good day to you. The request of our deceased Masonic brother that was communicated to me by the White Brothers made me realize that much had to be done in order to accord our deceased brother his final wishes. As the senior warden in the lodge in St. Francisville, I knew that we had been unable since the outbreak of hostilities to open the lodge because most of the brethren were off with their units engaged in the fighting. Nevertheless, I scoured the countryside and found four of the brethren, at which point I impressed the two white brothers in order to complete the funeral detail. When Commander Dubois and his funeral detail reached the top of the hill in front of Grace Episcopal Church, I, along with my small contingent of Masons, met him there, and at that point he transferred to me command of the funeral detail.
At the conclusion of the Episcopal Sacrament of Burial, we Masons, along with the remains of our deceased brother, retired to the rear of the cemetery where a grave had been dug east and west for the performance of the Masonic Grand Funeral Rites. It was obvious that Commander Dubois, the ship's executive officer, being a Brother Mason, had comprehended fully the import of Commander Hart's request for a Masonic burial. And of course, we understood as much. And we knew that were the circumstances reversed, that because of the universality of Masonry, we would enjoy the same respect. For example, we know now after the war that in the third day of the battle at Gettysburg, when Pickett and his division made their charge up Cemetery Ridge, there was among the soldiers a general who was struck by a mini ball and fell. As he did, he made the Masonic sign of distress. In the Yankee ranks was a captain who was a Mason, and he, despite the hail of bullets going in both directions, immediately ran to relieve the distress of his fallen brother. The lambskin apron is an emblem of innocence and the badge of a mason, more ancient than the golden fleece or Roman eagle, more honorable than the star and garter when worthily worn. By it, we are reminded of that purity of life and conduct, so essential for gaining admission to the celestial lodge above, where the supreme architect of the universe reigns in splendor everlasting. This evergreen, which once marked the temporary resting place of the illustrious dead, is an emblem of our faith in the immortality of the soul, but at the same time reminds us of our mortality. The depositing of the evergreen on the coffin of our fallen brother was followed by the rendition of the Masonic Grand Funeral Honors. We consign his body to the grave. We cherish his memory here and commend his soul to God who gave it. A central core of Masonic principles may be summarized in the following statements. God is love and power and truth and light. Upon conclusion of the Masonic Rites, Commander Dubois resumed command of his detail. Captain Lee, would you summarize the impact that the 1863 burial event has had on your life? Whilst in the midst of the Episcopal sacrament. I was struck with an overwhelming sense of foreboding that I would suffer a problem at the hands of the townsfolk for our having rendered these rites to the enemy. Yet during the Masonic service at the grave, when I deposited the white or lambskin apron in the grave, I was overwhelmed by the universality of our Masonic principles, and that relieved all of my apprehension. To that end, after the war, when I returned home, I commenced to maintain the grave of Commander Hart and to place flowers on it on the appropriate anniversary dates. And after a brief period, the United Daughters of the Confederacy have picked up that task and have maintained it to this day. At the time, I certainly did not perceive the potential for historical significance in what we did. It was simply our duty as Masons. 
But I now, in retrospect, can say that was the day the war stopped. This exemplification of Masonic principles should maintain the remembrance of this incident hereafter. God is love and power and truth and light. God is everywhere.